Well, amen. <laughs> well, amen. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Gathering of champions everywhere. Thank you for joining with us on this evening. This is going to be our third installment on Raise the State by Natalie Runyon. And if you miss the first two parts hosted by Dr. G and Minister Key, Magic Dutch, go back and watch them. Phenomenal, phenomenal. And what a great book. And I'm excited about this evening and the opportunity to cover the next part. We've talked about starting out with the hurt, the hurt. Then we talked about the hard. Now we're going to talk about the hope. And then we got one more section to do called the holy. So tonight, there's hope. You've been hurt. Okay. You've been hurt. You've been through the hard. Now let's look at some ways which we can get you to get you re-energized in hope because even in the word, God reminds us that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Hope deferred makes the heart grow sick. Amen. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, please guide me. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you this evening. We give you honor, praise, and glory. What a great God you are. What a wonderful God you are. What a kind God you are. You love us so much that you not only created us with plans and purpose, but you cover us. You covered us through the blood of Jesus for the sin that we so easily managed to beset us and those things that try to keep us from serving you in the way that we should. But we thank you, Lord, on this evening, and we thank you for those who are tuning in that they might hear from on high, that they might be encouraged and exhorted to move one step closer to being and achieving all that you have in store for them. It's still about perfecting the saints, and you are the potter, and we are the clay, and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Okay, let's jump in it. Y'all bear with me. I'm normally on the other end of an IT guy. But when it comes to doing things like presentations, I do them live. But we're going to bring right in now for your view. Raise the stay again by Natalie Runyon. And let us go to, okay, let's try page down. Or slide. Okay. <laughs> okay. Amen. Figure it out sooner or later. Okay, so this first slide this is about hope. This chapter is about pursuing Paul, pursuing Paul. And I thought this was a kind of an odd title for a chapter, pursuing Paul. What is it all about? Well, we'll see as we go through and we catch these nuggets why it is important for us to be pursuing Paul. By way of intro, the first thing that she introduces us to, a little thing here, it says, let your hopes, not your hurts, shape your future. And many of you may remember Dr. Robert Schuler. He was on TV for many years, and he was what I consider to be a rather down-to-earth, uh, pragmatic uh, gospel, not only teacher, but preacher. Let your hopes, not your hurts, shape your future. Now, what normally happens, that's an indicator. Many people let their hurts shape who they believe and perceive themselves to be. Past hurts tend to cause them to withdraw, tends to cause them to do things, to try to hide the hurt and the scabs and the swords that they've de developed over the years. So let your hopes, not your hurt, shape your future. You've got to focus on your hopes in order that you might be able to see your future. This he talked about uh, 
betrayal. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Betrayal. And she said it this way. There's a Judas at every table. There he is, a Judas at every table. We don't know when our so-called friends are going to turn on us. Ask Job. There's a Judas at every table. Ask Jesus. There's a Judas at every table. Ask Paul and Barnabas. There's a Judas at every table trying to rock the boat. So what do we do? We don't know when our so-called friends are going to be there for us, encouraging us, causing us to learn, because iron sharpens iron. Or if they're going to be there behind our backs, talking behind our backs, helping destroy our reputation, doing things that are not going to cause us to grow. So there's a Judas at every table, she said. And by the time she wrote this book, she had had more than her share of experiences with folks who looked like they meant for the good for her, but they were out to do her no good. And then, though it's difficult to admit, this will allow us to go on a new journey, on a new journey, excuse me, a new journey with the hope of restoration, reconciliation, and forgiveness. Okay, when you recognize and realize that the Judases exist and you may get hurt by them, only then can you turn and admit and then begin to shift your focus, okay? Have you ever been on a dead-end road where you turned, you made a wrong turn, and you ended up going down the street and there was no way out except the way you came back in. Well, that's the way it is. Sometimes when we go off on these journeys, we, if we don't admit that we're lost and we're on the road that leads to nowhere, we can't turn around and get on a new journey that's going to take us on a road of hope, one that's going to help restore us, one that's going to cause us to be able to reconcile with folks, one that's going to cause us in our heart to be able to forgive, because even those who harm us, the Judases, we need to forgive. Minister Key, would you like to jump in right there? Also, Pastor Sanders, I just thought that that was so good. I think that uh, for the belief, if we are going to go on this journey, we have to understand that there are going to be Judases at every table. And I love the fact that she says that it brings us toward the hope of restoration and reconciliation and forgiveness, because ultimately that's where we grow at. It is in those experiences that we grow and become more like Christ. If we are going to navigate this Christian journey, then all of our salvation is leading us to the same place that Christ was. So that whole piece about reconciliation, forgiveness, and restoration. As I forgive, I'm going to have reconciliation. And as I have reconciliation, I'm going to be restored. To deny that you don't feel the hurt of the betrayal, but it's that I can't feel the hurt of the betrayal and linger there. I have to move toward reconciliation. I have to move toward restoration and I have to ultimately move toward forgiveness so that I can continue to be do the will of the Lord. What is it going to profit me, Pastor Sanders, is if the work of my Judas stymies me or stymies me? If Judas came to stop me and I don't move toward forgiveness and I don't move toward restoration and I don't move toward reconciliation, then he was successful in his in his pursuit. Amen. That is so good. Thank you for expounding on that. Yes, we've got to move on. We can't get stuck but so because someone decided to betray us. It didn't stop Jesus, and it can't stop us. He got back on the road to uh, uh, Damascus. He got back on the road to Jerusalem, and he walked down the path that he needed to go, the Via della Rosa, up to as he marched triumphantly into Jerusalem, and he finished the mission that God had in store. He finished. He walked in obedience. Okay? Now, the next thing she talked about 
was hope in the wreckage. Now, Bitter Saki talked about in that last uh, part two about Paul and him be shipwrecked. Uh, shipwrecked. I mean, he got shipwrecked on more than one occasion. But you learn when you get shipwrecked, you learn some things about navigation. You learn some things about recovery. So even if you get shipwreck along the way, you are still alive. You have survived. And even though you may be in the rest, in the uh, midst of a wreckage, hey, you old to a plate. I don't know about you all, but my kids love Pirates of the Caribbean. Let me throw that in. And you know that they had some ships that were sank on more than one occasion. And so they ended up sometimes because they were shot down. They ended up having to float or swim back to uh, safety. And so if you find yourself in the wreckage, when you find yourself shipwrecked, you got to look and say, I got hope. I'm still alive. And because I'm still alive, now comes the time where you need to look or search or pursue your Paul. Now, Timothy joined Paul at one of the points where Paul was in the wreckage and he was recovering. And Paul was under intense, intense persecution at that time. Nero, who was the emperor, did not appreciate or settle or stand for anyone who had faith in Jesus. Did you hear me? If you had faith in Jesus at that time, you had better conceal it. But what a better time for Timothy to meet up with Paul. You know why? Because at this time, Timothy needs someone to help him navigate through the storm, navigate through Nero, navigate through what was facing him. Because he was young in his Christian walk. He had two options. He could have run and hid, or he could have found himself a Paul. Thank God that Paul came along at the time that Timothy needed him. The invitation was there that uh, Paul reached out to him and asked Timothy, do you want to join me in this journey? And Timothy accepted it in spite of what he do he was up against. He realized because of the things that Paul went through. See, when you get shipwrecked a few times, you know some things about survival. You know some things about recovery. And that is what Paul could share. See, your testimony of how you survived, your betrayal, how you survived your shipwreck is what people need to hear. And we need to take someone under our wings, like a Timothy. And, and if you're out there right now and you consider yourself be like Timothy, you're young in this Christian walk, but you want to find someone you can trust, someone that you can rely on. Keep in mind, none of us are perfect, but you want to find somebody who is being perfected by Christ and they want to continue this journey in the Christian walk and they go through some things. They get persecuted or they get shot down. They get called uh, goody two shoes and preacher's kids and other such things that are meant in a you know, derogatory for they're not meant as something to uplift the image of the people. But if you can find someone like that, that's it. So what happens? Timothy and Paul develop a spiritual relationship, a spiritual bond like no other. Paul is like a spiritual father, and Timothy is like a son. Amen. And there's nothing that you could ask for better. Timothy has a willing spirit to learn, and Paul has a willing spirit to allow him to follow him without worried about Timothy rising up against him, either intentionally or rising up in turn of notoriety. He's not worried about his image. See, Paul is in his latter 
years of his ministry at this time. So it's not about pumping himself up. Minister Key. So, Pastor Sanders, that is so very good. I often think about my career journey and every step of the way I sought out mentors to kind of help me navigate the new space that I was in. And so many times we are quick to seek out mentors for our careers or mentors for our educational processes, but we don't often seek out ministry mentors. And I think that ministry mentors add the same value as they do in spaces of career and education, because there are going to be some things along this journey that I need help navigating through. I need to speak to a Pastor Sanders who tells me, Key, I have been betrayed and this is how I managed through it. And because I made it through, you'll make it through. I need somebody to tell me to count it not strange, like Pastor Sanders said when they talk about you and say, "Oh, you the, you know, you you the brown nose, or you the 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 you know the goody two shoes." I need somebody to tell you that you need a ministry men mentor to keep you encouraged and tell you that these are not strange things. This is par for the course, almost. And they're on the other side and better for it. You'll make it too. We need ministry mentors. And so this part right here with Paul and Timothy is so very good to me. Amen. Thank you for expounding on that. That is really great. Minister Key. Okay. Let's talk about Hollywood wishes and a pastor's kid dreams. Okay. Natalie Runyon was a preacher's kid, but when it came time, to leave the house at the age of 21, she decided she wasn't going to go to a Christian college like her pastor father and her mother desired her to go. Now keep in mind, they encouraged her, they supported her, but she was determined she was going to Hollywood because she liked what she saw. She was going to Hollywood and she had been hurt by ministry because her father was hurt. He was a pastor. One day, the next day, he was a used car salesman. So she is deciding, I'm going in a different direction. I'm going to go out here. I've got this thing. I've got this gig. And this thing is going to work out so great. And I'm going to be in the bright light and have my 15 minutes of fame in the bright light. That didn't pan out. But check this out right before she left. Her mom did. The motherly thing, Christian motherly thing. She gave her big hug, hugged her real tight, whispered him, God is going to mess you up. What? I'm like, did I just read that she told her kid that God is going to mess her up? Oh, yes, God will mess with you when you get off track and you think you're not going to do his will that he's anointed and appointed for you to do. Oh, he'll let you go only so far. She had that long ride from the East Coast to the West Coast. But after being there just a short while, her dreams came crashing down. They came crashing down. Amen. How many have done that in your life? Your parents tried to steer you in one direction, but you decided you had made up your mind and you had used that word, I'm a grown person. I'm not going to use that whole thing, but we would say it's me and sometimes, but I've grown. I'm grown and I'm going to do what I see and what I please only to come back shaking your head later when you have to come back and admit to them and eat a little crow. You know what? You were right. I shouldn't have feared off on that path, but guess what? It's not all bad because you know what her parents do. Sometimes, sometimes, what you go through, the experiences is the greatest teacher. And when you have a few downfalls, one after another, and you get bruised up and hurt real bad, you remember what you went through and you don't want to repeat those things. So she had to go through, she had to go through. She had these grandiose dreams as you have as a kid. I had grandiose kids. Yeah, dreams as a kid. One point, I thought I was going to be an astronaut. At another point, I thought I was going to be a dentist. At one point, I thought I was going to be a great chemist, uh, exploring uh, different uh, things and finding and creating new chemicals for who knows what. It didn't pan out. 
reality set in at some point and reality will will put you thank you put you back on track reality will set in when you fail so uh do you want to chime in right there so I think that ultimately that is the prodigal son experience. That is really the experience is that just give me all my stuff. I'm going to go out and I'm going to find my way. And when you find yourself in unfavorable positions, it is always amazing that God will find a way to put you back on track and to put you back where you need to be. So I'm so thankful for that on tonight, Pastor. Oh, yes, he will put you back on track. And our mom knew the God they serve because you know why? She had probably been through a few experiences like that of all. I never, my mom told me a few things. She didn't say God was going to mess me up. But she said, you'll learn. You'll learn. Go, go ahead. Do what you think you need to do. But you'll learn. Amen. So, let us go to the next part. Here's the thing that is Christian's. And Bishop has talked about this a number of times. Please, please don't look at Christian counseling as being something negative. Don't look at it as a stigma. My daughter is actually a counselor. She's working on her doctorate, doctorate degree. She counsels. We need to get whatever we need for whatever resources God provides to us. And that means if we need to get it from a Christian counselor, that's what we need. Because you need to move from the hurt of the heart you know, in order to find hope. Where's your hope? Remember what I said earlier. Scripture tells us hope deferred makes the heart grow sick. You want to get your hope back in place in believing in faith that the hope is going to materialize into something. So it's not a one person job. You can't do it on your own. That's why God puts other people here in our lives. He puts other people to help us in this Christian walk. It's not a one man job. If you look at sports, they have teams. Okay, you're gonna say, well, tennis is a one person thing. But even in tennis, you have a coach. The coach is advising you what you need to do. So even in sports that appear to be only a one-person sport, you have other people advising you. In golf, you have a caddy. You also have a pro that's teaching you the things that you need to do along the way with your stroke and other things. Why? Because for you to get to your optimal level of execution, you need to be at your optimal. So going to counseling is not an absence of faith. It is not an absence of faith. If you've got things going on in your life where you have to take medication, say for depression or anxiety, take your medication. That's what you need because if you don't, what's going to happen? What's one of the biggest issues that we're faced with right now in the United States? What is it? We have an issue with mental problems throughout this nation. And you know what happens? Instead of getting help and hope for those people, you know where they are. They're in the jails right now. Amen. Because they were not able to handle or deal with their problems. And instead of people seeking mental hygiene for them, they ended up putting them in jail. It has gotten so bad that right now they are trying to add to many of the law enforcement teams, people who have been taught in the mental hygiene field so that they might be able to talk somebody off the limb before they do something that's harmful to themselves or somebody else. Seek the help. Don't be afraid. In fact, my daughter, I think has been counseling me when we're riding around in the car. I think she tried to pry things out of me so that she could counsel me and then turn it back. You know, I'm like, why did she ask me that question? 
Well, she may be trying to get to the root of some of the things she's observed to me and did give me some good Christian counseling on how to handle it. Is that making sense? We have to deconstruct, that word deconstruct, dangerous narratives. And what has happened in our lives, we've got these, uh, I don't know, these narratives that are so messed up about what this Christian walk is about, that our image of what our Father in heaven and a God, gracious God is all about, it's been totally destroyed by what we've seen. So in order for us to deconstruct it, we got to get our hope back. Otherwise, we'll keep spinning and be tangled up in a web that won't release us. And then in the presence of licensed professionals who understand, they understand both the critical and the clinical, the holy and the heart, the sacred and the science, you can find a safe place so that you can rewrite the unhealthy narratives so that they end up allowing you to see the biblical truths in language that you can understand, in a language that you can understand. And it's the key. As Pastor, you were so good. I'm not even going to chime in. I think you did great. <laughs> okay. The next we're going to talk about finding our Paul. What are we looking for? Good counselors? pastors and mentors that help us like it helped her to gain strength to continue her pursuit. See what happens if we get bogged down, if we get beat down, if we get befuddled about what we're supposed to be doing, you know what happens? We're not pursuing God. We won't pursue the plan or the purpose he has for our lives. That's the danger if you don't do this. So we got to look and see who those counselors, pastors, and mentors are who are out there who can help us to grow in this Christian walk. Now, one of the important things is you got to discern who the Pauls are and who they are. You got to know the difference between Paul and Judas. See, Jesus discerned that Judas was Judas. And he said at the table, he said, one of you is going to betray me. And it's like, who is it? Is it me? Is it me? It's the one that I'm going to guess. It's the one who's going to betray me. Who did he guess? Judas. Amen. You got to discern who is a Paul and who is a Judas. And do you want to link up and hook up with the Pauls? Bishop likes to talk about suspicion. Suspicion is the gift of discernment being used by the spirit of fear. But God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. So we let suspicion dominate us in our thought patterns so that the fear takes over. And then we're worried about any and everybody. We don't trust anybody. We're afraid to leave the house for fear that somebody is going to do us wrong. So fear paralyzes us and causes our thought processes become destructive. Key. Yeah, uh, Pastor Sanders, I agree with you um, on that, that we have to definitely be able to discern um, who is going to be our Judas and who is going to be our Paul. I do acknowledge in this chapter that there's sometimes there's some difficulty in always uh, right, rightly discerning. But I absolutely think that it is going to be necessary if we are going to stay on this journey. So absolutely, that was so good. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, next, when someone believes in you, let them. Have you ever seen people and you give them a compliment and you're serious about what you're saying to them and they turn around and they just brush it off like you didn't even say it? Why? Are we ignoring people who actually believe in us like our parents did and like others growing up? I have mentors who were of the cloth and mentors who were um, in the schools, uh, whether they were principals or teachers or coaches who helped mentor us. And so when they had something 
positive to say about you and you do that they believed in you. That was your cue for you to help let them continue to mold and shape you. I can look back and say I'm thankful for people like Coach Hill, for uh, Bibby Morgan and people like that along the way and for teachers, Miss Johnson, you know, uh, goodness, Miss Carter and all the, the ones that taught us along the way. Why? Because they were good Christian examples and they were there to help develop us and they spoke life into us. So we took at heart what they had to say. What if I had brushed off what they had to say? I never would have believed in myself. I had a teacher in the seventh grade, Miss Coffee, who called my mom in for a counseling session. And I'm like, what have I done wrong? Did my math teacher has called my mom in. So she brings her in. And we're sitting there and I'm nervous and I'm really thinking, oh my goodness, what did I do? I did think I was misbehaving that bad. That bad. <laughs> Amen. And then here's what Miss Coffee said. She looked at my mom and she said, Angelo, it should not be in this class. And the reason why he should not be in this math class, he's too advanced for this. I need to move him to an accelerated class. He should have been moved at the beginning of the year because I see the potential in him. So with your approval, we're going to move him into the class with the accelerated people. So what did that do? It showed me she had faith in who I was. But guess what? That first uh, quarter semester with those students was hard. Why? Because I was behind and I got discouraged, but she kept encouraging me along the way. I got discouraged because I had not been taught some of the concepts, but I received it. We got to receive what people are saying and not brush it off. Don't take for granted when you got people on the sidelines cheerleading for you, showing up in your life. Thank God. Amen. Thank God for it. Amen. Amen. And, and then you got to speak the word of God against defeat, doubt, questions, and poverty that's trying to come into your life. We are not the tail. We are not beneath. We are above. We are we are the ones who are rich. We're not the, the borrowed. We're the lenders. We are everything that God's word has said about us. So we need to call out the word when somebody or something is trying to get you to think negative of yourself. Now you got to look for the humble, tested, victorious intercessors, intercessors the prayer warriors. Normally these people may be silent. They don't make a big fuss. They go quietly about what they do, but they do it and they do it without a large following. They do it, whatever is going on around them. They don't have to be in the company of a lot of people. They do it in private and they do it in public. The same thing. They are consistent. They're not double-minded. Those are the folks you got to look for and discern. It was the shipwreck seasons that allowed Paul to walk Timothy through his, through his, what did I put there? One, that should be, through his journey. He, and that's how he was able to win. He talked him and walked him through the journey. Jesus will never leave nor forsake us. Any comments? No, Pastor Sanders, I thought that was so good. I, I really wanted to talk about that last part where you said uh, where we don't we, we're not so readily to accept um, compliments. And uh, I believe in the book review that Bishop and Elder did, they had a whole section where they talked about that, that we'll more readily receive a criticism than a compliment. And so that is just that leads us to that scripture in Corinthians, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Because just as you alluded to, we have to start telling ourselves what God says about us. And that will help us to accept 
the compliment that somebody pays us. We have to be built up. We have to be encouraged. We have to be affirmed. It is a necessary part of the journey. And if every time God sends someone to affirm you, you throw it off or you cast it aside, you'll always struggle with yeah. meeting the mark and staying grounded. Absolutely. So good, Pastor. Amen. And Paul saw the potential in Timothy. Amen. That's why he asked him to come along. He recognized it. Amen. Okay. Next, we're going to speed it up a little bit. Sit with the wise, not the popular. You know, growing up, we wanted to be in the popular group. We wanted to be popular among people. We wanted people to look at us and look up to us. But you see, when you look at the way God operates, he's not looking at folks that are trying to be popular. He's looking at those who may sit in quiet solitude, who have knowledge, understanding, and they have wisdom to share with folks. So don't try to sit in the group with those who are popular because they got their own little thing going and they have to constantly keep themselves pumped up. If you will humble yourself and find those uh, like Timothy did that are going to allow you to grow and to flourish in humility, then that's it. Paul was not threatened by Paul's, by Timothy, excuse me, by his potential. Paul was not threatened by, he was past his prime, as I said earlier, and he was going to help Timothy to grow. And you know what? I'm going to impart a little thing for here. You hear right here for everyone. You want to see people do better than you did when you are mentoring them, when you are leading them. You want to see them do better. I want my children to do better than I've ever done. What are you saying? That's right. I want them to do better than I've ever done. Why? Because that's how I feel. I've invested in them and God has invested in them. If God has that potential for them to do much better, certainly I want them to do much better than I ever did. So when I'm helping Bishop to to mentor and lead others in the ministry. I want to see them do better. I love it when I see other priests. My heart was so filled when Minister Key preached her initial sermon, when Elder LaShonda gets up to preach, when Elder Claretta, when Elder Felicia, when Elder Travis, when Elder Dr. McCray, when they get up and the others and they preach a message, I am full. I'm sitting there taking notes, and I'm like, Lord, I never thought about it that way. Thank you for the insight. Thank you for giving them the revelation. Why? Because that's the way we've got to be when we get to this point. It's not about trying to be like the frogs, trying to get out of the hot water and trying to pull each other back, but it's like, okay, I want to prop you up. If we do this together, we can all get out of this thing. Okay. Two, don't focus on the surrounding yourself with a large group of followers. I mean, of pop, a large followers and popularity. A large followers and popularity is a large group. We find our, we find our balls by remembering where we came from and who we have become because of the trusted voices we've heard along the way. Let me say that again. We find our pause by remembering our journey, where we came from, and then remembering the voices that we trusted along the way because you can see where you came from, and you can hear and remember the voices that spoken to you in that, and those voices are the ones that you're going to hear from the Pauls that you encounter. Is that making sense, Minister King? Amen, amen, amen. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, um, Pastor Sanders. I think that, you know, sometimes in our quest to be popular or sit with the popular group, we miss out on the wisdom 
of, of the older or more seasoned saints. And, and typically in my journey, those are who I want to sit with. I want to sit at the feet of a mother who knows how to get a prayer through. I want to sit at the feet of somebody who knows more than me, because I believe that, that that's what's needed for my growth. I hope that's what's needed for everybody to go for specifically for my growth. So absolutely. Amen. Okay. Remember the words spoken over you. Again, Timothy joined Paul in Paul's later journey uh, while he was facing persecution, uh, but he did get and remember the words that uh, Paul spoke over him. Timothy was faced with that decision that I spoke about earlier, but he accepted his calling and he followed and accepted the invita invitation that came to join Paul. And again, the two developed a trusted relationship between the two of them, father figure in the son. I spoke about those earlier. When someone believes in you, let them. Did I just go back? No. No, I, I think just... you gotta go forward to the next one. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, okay. She jumped on that one. Okay. Good. <laughs> I'm looking like that was so good. I went back. <laughs> okay. Okay. I'm sorry, like, did I just say this? Amen. Amen. It's all good. Okay. A few nuggets to consider concerning pursuing Paul. One, cling to your faith. Keep your conscience clear. Don't fall into the trap of leaving your calling. Love God and love people. The first thing, the two commandments, love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second is like this. Love thy neighbor. Who's your neighbor? Everybody. Fulfill the Great Commission. What's well, the Great Commission? We got to go out and help fish and help people uh, receive the gospel so that they might be saved. You have a purpose and a calling screaming over your life. Don't forget that. Let the hope of Christ not to hurt from men be your testimony. A few questions. When have you encountered a Judas, a Saul in your life? Just think about these as you reflect. Are you still reeling from the impact of your encounter or encounters with them? What steps have you taken to shift your focus back to seeking and serving God? And are you actively seeking to find a Paul to partner with on your journey? Any, any thoughts? It is the key. Oh, I was just thinking that last question is so good um, because, yeah, we have to be intentional about seeking a Paul to partner with. I think that if we think that it'll just kind of hit us over the head, uh, it, it won't happen. But we have to be intentional about seeking out Pauls. I think we have to be intentional about seeking out ministry mentors if we want to grow and we want to develop and we want to stay, stick and stay in the faith. Absolutely. So good. Amen. So let us go. To the next chapter, chapter eight. We'll get through this. Controversy. We were talking about decorate your office. In the beginning, it wasn't entitled controversy, but it talked about controversy. I always put in one controversial item. It makes people talk. That came from Dorothy Draper. Prince had its own called controversy back in the early 80s. Controversy. Controversy stirs people to think and to speak. And so sometimes controversy is not bad. It will help us get uh, dialogue started so that we can kind of talk things out so we can see from different points of view what's going on. Now, she went, that beat Natalie, she was going to an interview. She had had multiple jobs, none of which she seemed to have completed or spent much time at. So she was bouncing from one job to another, not a career, from one job to another. And you can go and look all the different things she did. But one of the individuals looked at it. I believe he was the head pastor. He looked at it and he didn't see it as a failure, uh, a bunch of things. 
that were tied together, that were, <coughs> excuse me, that caused her to be a failure. He looked at them as many altars. What's a mini altar? You got to come to Jesus from time to time. <coughs> and when you go through these things, these different jobs, these different things with relationships, it will cause you to go to the altar and spend some time with the Lord. And that's what this headmaster looked at when she was looking at this thing and looking at her resume as being totally negative. He put a positive twist on it. Look at it this way, many altars. And so in doing this, this has given her an opportunity to keep running and looking for something not easier to do, but looking for what God intended for the do. Sometimes we'll get caught up trying to be like our friends, looking and see they've been in their job 10 years. They got 401ks. They're successful. They're doing well. They got the house on the hill. You know, they got the swimming pool. They got this and that, the big cars. They ain't what God called you to do. Stay in your lane. You might have to go through a few things, but that's not what's most important. What's most important is for you to recognize what God is calling you to do at that time. Excuse me. So, I jumped ahead of myself. But that's okay. That interviewer saw it. Now there's a pickle of undecidedness because she kept changing jobs, but he saw it for what it was. And eventually he said, by having those mini altars, those small altar calls, that she was going to find out eventually what it was God wanted her to do, and that she would go and do it. He scarred failure. What would come at that point, a sweet song of redemption when you put that twist on it, when you no longer look at it in the negative, but you look at it in the positive. It becomes a sweet song when you look at those scars you've got. Amen. Amen. Okay. Hope, promise. Regardless of your resume of brokenness, of doubts and disappointments, God has set a table in the presence of your enemies. Even though you think you have failed in all these things, God has still prepared a table in the presence of your enemies to include your Judases who want to take you down. As Jesus, Judas came to the table. God had prepared the table for Jesus to sit at and to eat and to drink with the other disciples. But that didn't stop him from doing, using that as a launching point for the remainder of his ministry here on earth. Whatever brings you here, if you are worn down, angry, confused, frustrated, tired, overwhelmed, discouraged, you are in good company. That's good. I'm going to throw my hands up. You're in good company. <laughs> That's good. Uh, I, you're in big, big, good company. Between my military career in ministry, I've seen it, I've felt it all. Gee, I've lived the book, I think, in some cases. And it's not because I think people, in some cases, were intentionally doing anything. It's just that you have a tendency to ball up in the corner sometimes when you keep getting hurt. Amen. You got to have hard conversations to deconstruct and then reconstruct what you were tangled up in so that you can untangle it in the doubts and the second thoughts that you have. But don't quit. Don't quit. Inferior design. When you think you're an inferior design, God doesn't do inferior work. Did you know that? He created and he wonderfully designed you. You are a beautiful vessel that's wonderfully made. You were created in the image and likeness of God. Your design is not inferior. Get that thought out of your mind. But you needed to address it. Are you afraid 
because we're talking about decorating your office, then you're going to be moved again and again and again, so you never take the stuff out of your box. You know, I quit doing it at work. I brought my stuff home because they kept moving me. Gee, in the last six years, I've probably moved seven or eight times from office to office to office, so I quit putting my stuff up. But we got to get to a point where even though we may end up getting blue, we got to have some permanence. You got to have the attitude. I'm going to be here for a while. Let me get decorated. Let me put my plaques up. Let me put the good stuff up. The stuff from the Bible, the little things that remind people it's about God. And that's who I serve. Those things. So, with that said, you got to go ahead and put those things up. And then we'll go from there. Now, I don't know why somebody is calling me. You should be on the line unless you got something you want to add in. Put it in the comment block there. Amen. 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 I'm sorry. <laughs> I had to get a laugh up. Put it in the comment block. If you got a question, then we'll, we'll get to it and answer it. Thank you. Amen. So you got to look and aspire for longevity. But the fear of hurt keeps us from hanging up those pictures that we talk about. Not only you want to decorate your walls, plant a guard, open up your home, prepare your office, whatever position you're in. You know why? Because even though you're not perfect, God's presence is there. And that's what's most important. Resolve to stay, invest, trust, love, forgive, be held accountable, and transition, change, and shift. Any comments there? And key. So I think that this was so good. This entire chapter was so good to me. Um, one of the things when I read one of T.D. Jake's books that he talked about is that he never hires a contract or anyone to work on a big project who have not suffered some failures. Because he says that the failures that people suffer and how they overcome them speak more to their accomplishments than anything else. So he says, so... I love that she said, talked about this controversy and being broken and not feeling like her resume was worthy because I think that oftentimes in life, we want to hide our failures, but celebrate our victories. But we learn more from our failures than we do from our victories. It is the failure that lets you know that God was with you and would never forsake you. It's every time that you fell that you knew that he would re restore you and that he would heal you. So we learn so much from our failures, even though we don't always embrace them. So good, Pastor. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we want to talk about the trauma and the triage. You know, out on the battlefield, they have what they call triage. How bad is your trauma? You got a sucking chest wound or you just got an injury that needs to be bandaged up? When you go to the hospital, to urgent care, what do they do? They triage you. You got to be triaged. So the author was looking back, back into the 90s. Punky Brewster, yes, I'm telling my age because I remember when it used to come out. Now, it was a 90s comedy show. There was an orphan who was raised by a single elderly man, but she had like a time capsule, kind of a vessel that you could open up. But when you open up and you look back into this time capsule, so to speak, what does it do? Does it open up her? Does it open up scars? Or you, can you look back? Can you see victory over the things that you went through? You know, Christians, we live in a glass bowl, much like Punky Brewster as a child star. They live in a glass bowl with everybody looking and following them. They couldn't go anywhere without people recognizing them. And likewise, we as Christians, and she as a preacher's kid, could not go anywhere without people looking and recognizing her as a preacher's kid when she was growing up. So they were being scrutinized from top to bottom by everybody that was looking. They were being scrutinized. And so I called it a, it was a vault that she actually referred to as, as. But the things as you look back as you were growing up, that you couldn't unsee? What about the things that you have images of that you wish you could plot out? 
but you can't go back and blot them out. You saw them growing up, and they were not good things. Uh, and they caused you harm, whether it was mental or emotional or otherwise. You can't unsee. You can't undo them. Can you go back and look at those things and say, I've got victory over them? In some cases, they were not only confusion, confusing, excuse me, but they exposed this religious charade. Religious charade. See, some people got exposed because what they were supposed to look like according to what Christians were being trained up to be. Evangelicals, as they called themselves, was not consistent with Christian behavior. And it, it was hurting to see that happen for someone to fall or get caught up in something. Well, guess what? Don't get stuck on it. Even mature Christians make mistakes and can fall to a sin. Um, you, you're saying, well, no, 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 I wouldn't do that. Last time I checked, David, a man after God's own heart, slept with Bathsheba and got her pregnant. Need I say more? Need I say more? I don't need to say any more. We have to get the mindset that God is a forgiving God and he will allow us if we confess and repent to get beyond anything that we do on this earth. Thank God that the people aren't our final judge. When the day of judgment comes around, I won't have anybody standing to my left or right. I won't have Satan. I won't have my critics, my uh, people, my haters all around me. It's just going to be me and Jesus in the books. Amen. Amen. So the first step to healing is to acknowledge you've been wounded. And only then can you get triaged. Amen. You got to admit it. Okay. Accountability versus church hurt. Okay. I know a lot of us have written off, have written off church hurt to be the issue when the real issue was accountability. We didn't want to be accountable. And because we didn't want to be accountable, we didn't do something we were supposed to do, or we did some things we shouldn't have done, or we did it in a way that we should have, and now we don't want to be accountable. So we say, is church hurt? Amen. You got to know the difference. You got to be still accountable. God is holding us accountable for our actions. Does he expect us to be perfect? No. But you got to look at the difference between what you thought was church hurt, and what is really the actions of being accountable. We have to be accountable as pastors, ministers, elders, and leaders, and even the congregation to our senior pastor. And sometimes he says some things that we don't want to hear. Amen. Let's keep it real. Amen. But sometimes he has to keep us accountable. And it'll work on you. Amen. What a Mr. King. <laughs> It'll work. It'll work on you, but you got to get back up and say, "Okay, I know where he's coming from. He is being accountable to God, and better. We'll do better next time in whatever it is we do." You want to chime in right there? No, no, no. I think I think you were yeah. talking so good, uh, Pastor Sanders, that oftentimes, you know, it really is accountability. So many places in our lives, we're not accountable. And then when we have to be, we, you know, we take offense to it or we're easily offended or we wear our emotions on our sleeves, but we will never grow without accountability. I have I had one of my early bosses tell me, listen, I would rather you tell me, hey, I don't know what happened today. I had a brain fart or brain freeze, but it won't happen again than to make a million excuses as to why it didn't get done. I'd rather you just take accountability and we can move forward rather than you making excuses about why it didn't happen. So that's so good. Yeah, that's, that's so good. That is perfect for what they're trying to illustrate there. We are accountable to God. We are accountable to those that he places over us to see about our soul salvation. So we need to reflect and make sure it's not an accountability issue versus a church hurt issue. And then the fear of our past holding her, she looked back and found this ceramic baby doll 
that her mother had given her. And it was creepy. It was creepy. It creeped her out back then, and it was creeping her out there. What have we got in our past that's creeping us out, that's still there, instead of moving on past it and being able to look it straight in the eye and dealing with it? Are we still allowed it to influence us? We're not going to break generational curses that we saw, whether it was alcoholism. I gave up drinking because my father was an alcoholic. My grandfathers on both sides were alcoholic. I gave it up because one day our pastor preached. He said, do you know what your kids are doing when you're asleep? Are they dipping down to drink the dinner wine? I went down after that. I went to my refrigerator. I took out my 40 cans of beer. I took out my wine coolers. I took out my boxes of wine. And I poured them all down the sink, including the hard stuff. Why? Because in order for me to break the generational curse that was going from generation to generation, I needed to hold up and say, I can look back, it was bad. It was hard because I saw what my mom went through and when she dealt with the alcoholism, not that it was on her behalf, but on their behalf. But she moved on beyond it. So with that said, we got to move on so that we break the generational curses, stop the cycle, stop the insanity, as Susan Powder would have said, stop it. Okay, God has given us the opportunity to decorate our whole house. But it won't be perfect, as I pointed out earlier, or conflict-free. Inspect that. But what it will be is good, righteous, and holy, because he dwells there. Though the author's parents' a story is part of who she is, it is not the end of her testimony. She moved beyond her father being removed this pastor one night and becoming a used car salesman the next day for whatever reason it happened. She was able to recover from all that, even though she went through some things, bouncing from one place to another with the many altars. That was not her final testimony, and we see it in the book. Amen. Now, quickly here, a few nuggets to consider about unpacking and decorating. Let your story have a different ending than the previous generations, including your parents. Adopt an I won't quit attitude. We're not going anywhere, not quitting. And finally, take time to decorate your office like you got some permanence, like you got some real permanence where you are. Amen. Some questions you might want to consider. What areas of your life need to be triaged from trauma? Are you afraid that your life is filled with failure because it's filled with temporary stints in jobs and even relationships and lacking longevity? Can you finally get beyond your past to unpack and decorate your office? Think about some of those things. Anything you want to chime in? Right no, there. Pastor, you were that that's self-explanatory. It's so good. Amen. Okay. Then we're moving to the final chapter. We're moving right along. Here we'll wrap up. Amen. With chapter nine. I'm not leaving. I'm going. I had to look at that three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times. What is the chapter called? I'm not leaving. I'm going. Yet that's synonymous. No. It's not synonymous, and we'll show why. In the intro, she talked about some things. Some people are meant to stay put, and some are meant to go. You got to know the difference between when you need to stay put and when you need to go. Because some people who keep going are supposed to stay put, and they keep looking over their shoulder. And so instead of advancing and looking forward, they keep looking back. It's like driving down the road and you're looking in your rearview mirror all the time and not focus on the road ahead. Yes, you need to glance back periodically, but like the Isaac brother said, 
good, going down the highways of my life, staying to the right because I don't want to look back because that in the other side of the road will only take me back where I came from. If you're going forward, you need to focus forward so that you can move forward. Don't focus on the past. Amen? Is that understood? And then the Great Commission. That's ultimately what all of our callings are about. The Great Commission is about saving souls for God and being a part of building the kingdom, being part of God's army. That's it. Amen. Well done, my good and faithful servant, is what we want to hear when it's said and done. Now, the pandemic caused a shift and caused some things to change. And in some cases, things haven't recovered. Some saints haven't made it back to the house of prayer. Amen. Even though we're on the other side of the pandemic. The pandemic changed thought processes and caused people to get comfortable in places where they shouldn't have gotten comfortable. Now we're trying to shake the leaves, to shake the bushes, to get them to come back to the house of worship. Never did the scripture change in Hebrews where it says, forsake not the assembling of the saints, I believe is 10 and 25. That is still a requirement. Why? Because the shepherd is there. Yes, I know we can look at it through streaming live. Yes, and there may be times if you're sick or if you're indisposed where you need, need to do that. But the other times, get your goody two feet. Well, I don't want to go there. I almost said something. Get your rooty duty into the church, onto the church property, because that's where God expects to see you in the house with the other saints. Amen. Uh, even Jesus had to go. Now we're beginning to see the difference between I'm not leaving him go in order for him to fulfill what it was done, what was expected of him, even he had to go. Whether you're a church staff or you are a volunteer, you're serving is part of the pricey privilege that God demands. But there are transitions that will occur that will cause division or strife in the body of Christ if you're not careful. That's what you got to be careful of. So there may be a time you may have to leave to avoid it. And there may be times you need to stay to avoid strife and division in the body of Christ. We can do without quitting. Quitting is just giving up on everything. We don't need to quit. We need to have skin in the game and be as Bishop would say, all in. We can leave without causing division. When you get ready to leave, if it is time to leave, you've got to do it in an orderly fashion. How do you do it? Makes all the difference in the world and how people hear about you leaving makes all the difference in the world. You've got to let the leadership know it has got to be a healthy understanding and dialogue communication between all is the why. And Bishop has given his blessing to some people leaving because they had a calling that was upon their life. Sometimes it's a calling to start their own ministry. Sometimes it's a cause calling to move and go somewhere else in planet Earth. Sometimes it's a call to go do some other thing because they're moving. And because they're moving, they are no longer in proximity to the ministry and they need to go. But you need to have that dialogue with the leadership so there's no misunderstanding because you know what? Suspicion and all sorts of other things will creep in. I'll come up with a reason. You know, I don't know, but... And then you got your laundry list of stuff. You'll come up with, well, you know, so and so. We got to be careful of that. So be clear so that people can communicate and articulate to other folks why you went. Okay. So changes are going to come in the church. Be aware. Cloggy transitions, conflicts uh, in leadership. Paul and Barnabas, I mentioned that earlier. They couldn't see eye to eye. 
The last time I checked, Peter and Paul couldn't see eye to eye. At one point, Paul had to correct Peter on some of his conduct. But when you get to a point where you may be bumping heads and you both may have the right uh, heart about serving God, but you can't serve him together in the capacity you used to, then you got to do what you got to do. Babyface and L.A. Reid used to produce together, and they had hits all over the charts. Guess what they don't do now? They don't write songs together. They split, and they went off, and they do production stuff, for the most part separate. They may do executive production together, but you won't see them in the studio working on the same song. Sometimes you got to split when you got some creative and business uh, differences that you don't think you're great. Are they still friends? Yes. Are they still advancing the music industry? Yes, they are, but they're not working as the production team that they used to work as. Amen. That making sense. And that's what we got to do. Paul and Barton went on their merry way, but they continue to do what they did faithfully for God without putting a blemish on the ministries. Amen. We can celebrate transition without providing all the gory details. See, we want to celebrate, but we want to talk about every thing like they do on social media. Now we want to give all the gory details about failures and stuff. Let it go. Let it go. You don't need to put stuff out, people's stuff out in the wind, nor even your stuff. Let it go. Amen. And move on. And last, under even Jesus had to go, his final for leadership to begin to have a healthy understanding and communication about transition of folks. When the, you know, when the time comes for changes and people go, you know, whether uh, to another place from the church or whether it is uh, the staff or community. Amen. Let me get off of this. I went back there just for a second because I'm not clicking forward. Okay, losing a leader. This is tough. If we stay in, in a church long enough anywhere, we're going to lose leaders. It hurts when we lose, uh, but we got to celebrate and wish them well. It's even worse if we lose a leader because of a scandal or moral failure. And then sometimes they may be launching, as I pointed out earlier, their own ministry. Leaders will come and go. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But what happened with the disciples? They ended up losing Jesus. Why? Because he had to go. He told them he had to go. Now this I like, leaving and grieving. Leaving and grieving. Leaving is normal, natural part of life. You got to go sometimes. You got to go. I see you now. Being left behind is painful when they go. It feels like they abandoned you like a child, like Punky Brewster. You end up alone. You feel like that they didn't love you like one of her friends who ended up going when the time came. Ended up going when the time came. Why? Because she was raised by her grandmother, but because her mom had died, but she was taken from her daddy because he had issues. And then she didn't know the rest of her family. So after much prayer, after somebody did a DNA test, it went on, what is that thing where you go out and do your ancestry? They discovered that she had siblings in other family. And so she prayed, and even though she was a mentor and a friend to the author, she prayed and she left, but she did it in an orderly fashion. But we'll leaving and we'll grieve their departure. We'll feel angry and we'll have all those other things that come with abandonment. People get messy. Oh my goodness. Social media, people get messy. 
Messi, Messi, Messi. I don't need to go any further. Y'all have seen some posts on Facebook and other places that I had no business being there where people are fighting their battles out in the open so that everybody is seeing the dirty lake, a laundry aired out. The world, my goodness, what's wrong with the folks? And then again, her father, who went from a pastor to a used salesman overnight. God reminds us that he will never leave or abandon nor fail us. That's a promise you can depend on. And then as we jump over here, when it's time to go, you got to know when it's time to go. God is asking us to go. Doesn't come with a warranty nor five-year plan or a GPS when he tells us time to go. It's time to go, as April, as Moses. When he says, it's time to go, you may not know where he wants you to go, but you gotta be obedient. When you take up your cross and follow Jesus, he'll order your steps if he allow him to. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Choose to abide and strive to follow him Choose God's best what he has in store over the world's sloppiness. That's why he tells us up front in Luke 9 and 23, first, deny yourself. Because if you don't, you'll be tainted with the messiness of the world and trying to call, uh, carry a cross and follow Jesus where he's trying to take you. A messy cross filled with worldly things. It's in the going that you start the building and get it creative because of the discomfort in the but it forces a holy maturity that comes with spiritual adolescence and growing pains what you go through will cause you to spiritually mature you will get uncomfortable in whatever it is and you will move beyond your adolescence of spirituality to a maturity in your spirituality, get off the milk, get off just the bread. It's time to put some meat in your mouth. Going isn't quitting or abandoning anything. When God asks you to go, you're not quitting. You're not abandoning folks. You're doing what he has asked you to do. And now, as we're wrapping up here, the last two items before we go, that last there's obedience and going okay if he tells you to go like her friend it's time to go you gotta go she's going back to connect with family that she never do it's time to go god called her to go back sometimes obedience is the greatest ministry to one another and the greatest weapon against complacency and comfort see we'll get complacent and we'll get comfortable like we did during the pandemic where we are and we won't go we won't go to church or we won't go wherever god asks us to go amen so you got to keep that in mind her friend in her partner ministry was much like paul and barnabas he was telling her or she was telling her it is time for her to go in a different direction that's what happened with paul and barnabas it became a time to go in different directions, but in love and mutual respect of one another beyond the differences. Going is not quitting. We got seasons we go through, whether it's relationship, jobs, or whatever. We got seasons. Sometimes we just need to stop and catch our breath and regroup. Ecclesiastes says, finishing is better than starting. Patience is better than Pride is better than pride. Finishing is better than starting. Finish what you start. Patience is better than pride. Amen. The life which is lived for God, which is rooted in Christ, is oneness of self-denial, of love, of purity, of strenuous pressing towards the mark. 
and it is better than its beginning. How we leave makes a difference. And I spoke about that briefly. Katie, you want to chime in as I get ready to come to the last. No, I think what you said is so very appropriate and apropos about the way you leave making all of the difference about what your next looks like and whether you'll ever be able to move into the purpose of God. Because if you leave wrong, here's what I know to be the truth. You'll have to go back and get it right at some time, at some point. So you'll always kind of be in a holding pattern until you do it correctly. You do it the way that God says. So, so good, Pastor. Amen. Not to mention, people will come back and ask you, not you but the people who knew you, how you left. Amen. Amen. It used to be the case. You want to leave on good terms. Amen. A few nuggets to consider. I'm not leaving. I'm going. We can't rip off a Band-Aid in the kingdom of God without some scarring. You rip it off, there's going to be some scarring that remains. We all carry spar scars. Excuse me. Prayerfully, they are of testimonies. Prayerfully, those scars are testimonies in not unresolved pain. Did you catch that? Remember I spoke about that time. We have scars and we have pus under the scars. Hopefully, the scars are healed. It is about testimonies. It's not about unresolved pain, which is like both. Uh, uh, Pus that's under the skin. Amen. Okay, leaving can be done well in the family of God. And going is not quitting. Questions to think about. What areas in your life need triage with trauma? Are you afraid that your life is a failure because it is filled with temporary stints or lacking longevity? Can you finally get beyond your past and unpack? Can you do these things? Katie, you want to chime in there before the final thoughts? No, sir. That was so good. No, sir. Okay, some final thoughts to think about. We all need to find balls that we can trust, to help lead, mentor, and facilitate our growth in this Christian walk. There's the potential for Judas to be seated at the table. Be discerning in your spirit, like Jesus, to spot and avoid becoming a victim of their betrayal. Now, Jesus had to play it out. He knew that was part of the plan for him to go to the cross, the betrayal. But don't worry. It may be part of your growth. Even if one of these Judases or two or three slip through and make contact and cause pain in your life. Don't be afraid to settle in and decorate. You're not perfect, but God is still perfecting you. And lastly, don't get so comfortable in a position, a relationship, or place that you can't see when God is ready for you to move or move on. Any thoughts for closing? Yeah. No, I'm just telling you that chapter was just so very good. And I know that lots of times we struggle with moving. We struggle. I don't know about anybody else. I struggle with moving. I struggle with transition. I struggle with change. But I'm telling you, if we are going to be successful in this walk, if we are going to grow, change is necessary. So, so good, Pastor. What a great review tonight. Hey, Amen. And thank you so much, Minister Key, for sharing. This has been so great so far, you know. Is first about the hurt, the heart, the hope. And next will be the holy, which we will cover on next Tuesday. Thank you all for joining with us on this installment. We pray that we'll see you in person in the place on tomorrow at 7 p.m. for worship service. And if we can, join with us streaming live. And then again on Saturday morning. 8 a.m. Join us. Join us. Join us for intercessory prayer. For intercessory prayer. Why? Because the lifeblood of the church, as Bishop has said many times, is prayer. We pray together as a family. We stay together. Sometimes we don't know what's going on with you. So make it a point to be there with us. And then we got all sorts of things coming up, which I'll let key 
Let us keep talking about with the sisters. Amen. I'm excited about what's getting ready to go down. Amen. Amen. So we have sermons for sisters coming up in just a couple of weeks. Our kickoff revival is going to be on May 1st. That is a Wednesday night. So find yourself in the building that night. You are not going to be disappointed. I promise you, our speaker is amazing, amazing, amazing. So please join us on our kickoff night, September 1st. And our Blackout Weekend is May 18th and 19th. At this point, you should all have invited and invited and invited. And if you have not picked up your media device right now, go through your contacts and start inviting. If you need the flyer to send us the invitation, please reach out to me. I will make sure that you have it. It is on all of our social media platforms. So Blackout Weekend, May 18th and 19th, we have our sister's closet. It is going to be such a dynamic time. You don't want to miss it. I'm telling you, this is going to be the highlight of the sister's ministry. Join us, join us, join us. Thank you, Pastor. Amen. And again, thank you for joining us. I'll close this quickly with prayer. And apologize for going over time, but there's so much packed in to this book. This book really needed about three months to unpack all of it so that we could uh, decorate <laughs> around the church with the things, the sayings, and the uh, truths that we were able to uh, find in too old for a while. Holy Spirit, please guide most gracious. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord God, for this evening, for this opportunity to share this book. Thank you so much for introducing us to Natalie Runyon and to raise to stay. Help us to take these things which are consistent with biblical principles, but are based on experiences and testimonies, not only from her life, but also from our own lives, that we might continue to grow in truth, that we might continue to grow in our spiritual walk, that we might continue to serve you as we go out and do what you have asked us to do with the Great Commission, first in Jerusalem, then in uh, Israel, and then in all of Judea, and then the other most parts of the world. We share the gospel for the salvation of those who don't know you in the pardoning of their sin. We thank you for equipping us and moving us and encouraging us and always being at our side. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. amen. Well, God bless you and good, good night. night. Good night.